The Lisburn Road may be only a 10-minute drive from the Ardoin Road, but with its fashionable boutiques and upmarket cafes, it seems like a different world. For the majority of people in places like this, the closest they'll get to the naked sectarianism of Ardoin is watching it on television. Events at Holy Cross are unusual, even by Northern Ireland standards. In most parts of the province, life goes on without any obvious sectarian strife. But to what extent does the subtle sectarianism that lurks in the leafy suburbs contribute to the hate we've witnessed on the streets of North Belfast? The answer is a lot, according to a major new study of sectarianism in Northern Ireland by the Irish School of Ecumenics. The majority may wish to distance itself from sectarianism, but the six-year study concludes that the raw hatred, such as that seen in Ardoin, is simply a product of a system to which we're all connected. I don't think it is possible to live in Northern Ireland and to have no connection. And so it's, it's important to look at more subtle forms. What I'd want to look at is in areas where there's good mixing across religious and political boundaries. It's a system that people don't sign up to. It's, it's one that you confront by virtue of living in this society. And, and so um, you, you are, are forced into situations with sectarian implications. In fact, not only is the moral majority implicated in sectarianism, they may even be benefiting from it. It's an old truth, but it's still a valid one, that the more comfortably off you are, whether you're a Catholic or a Protestant, the more you can benefit from the sectarian divide, sort of without having to take the hits. The hits are always taken by the Glen Brins and the lower Ardoins of, the, uh, of this world. <laughs> The Holy Cross dispute began in June. Protestants in Glenbrin blocked the Ardoin Road after they say Catholics attacked someone putting up loyalist flags. The dispute has brought age-old hatreds to the fore, leaving its origins irrelevant. I would say our relationship with them has never been great. We have learned to tolerate each other, you know. I'm not saying there's not friendships between people, certain individuals, but basically it's a case of you leave us alone and we leave you alone. The Upper Ardoin community has lost all trust in the ability of Republicans to control their instincts of genocidal hatred for anything Protestant. To outsiders, at its most basic level, the dispute is an example of Protestant bigotry towards Catholics. But the Protestants claim that sectarianism isn't confined to their side. You fucking should be ashamed of yourself, the you age of you! You fucking carried away orange bastards! Their houses have been attacked, and they say they have been intimidated from the local shops by Catholics. On that basis, they defend their protest. Is this protest sectarian? Some might say, and some might believe it, but in my eyes, no. We've never had nothing against the Catholic community who would be responsible for leading their children to school if that was the only thing that they were doing. But there is individuals within... Uh, that group, who would go to school by day and come back with cover of darkness and attack our homes. Oh yes, yeah, certainly, I'm sure they do have legitimate grievances. I'm not calling anybody 
um, a liar or who's bombing your house or who's petrol bombing your house. All I'm trying to make the point is that my nine-year-old daughter's not doing it. For Catholics, the school is a vital part of their community. To Protestants, it's a threat, signifying the advance of the Catholic population into their area. Across North Belfast in the last four years, the number of Catholic secondary school children has grown by 17%, compared to just 2% growth in the Protestant population. Catholic children are not to blame for Protestant grievances, but they are certainly the issue. Of course it's an issue when you have four Catholic run schools within a 100% loyalist area. I do have a problem with that. I don't think it should be there. I believe that they should have built their schools within their own community. And I also believe that the M schools was built there 30 years ago. They were built there for a reason. And that was the Catholic community was hoping to be living here within 30 years. And that's why they were built here. Loyalist branding of the Glenbrin estate belies a harsh truth. Much of the housing is old and crumbling. Almost a third of Protestants across North Belfast have unfit housing, according to the housing executive. And the population has halved in the last 10 years and now stands at 1,500. In contrast, Catholic Ardoin is bursting at the seams. And the seams in this case are the peace lines. Of the 1,800 people on the housing waiting list in the area, 1,700 are Catholic. New houses for Catholics along the front of the Ardoin Road, creeping inexorably towards the peace line, are seen by some Protestants as provocation. Why should we move to accommodate these people? These are our homes and we have worked hard. So I don't see why we should move because the Catholic population within our diet is bursting at the seams. It's not our problem, it's their problem. I think the Glenburn residents just didn't like our houses just going quite that far up the road. Um, the people in Alliance Avenue have been living with that for a number of years. You know, we those new houses haven't gone any further up that road than Catholics ever lived. You know, they've always had Catholics in Alliance Avenue. But the Protestant fears that Catholics are coveting their territory have been fuelled by politicians. Local Sinn Féin councillor Margaret McLenaghan told the Belfast Telegraph in August the reason there were empty houses boarded up in Glenbrin was because they wouldn't give up territory to Catholics. There is an argument which is going about was unionists will, will talk about which they call territoriality, which I fundamentally disagree with. And the territoriality says that this area is designated Protestant, therefore uh, no Catholic houses can ever be built there. But you see, a house is a house. Right? You just built the house, it's just a building. Right? And whoever moves into it is a person who needs a house. Regardless of the legitimacy of their grievances, the Glenbrun residents' method of airing them has brought widespread condemnation. The malign influence of sectarianism on politics, identified in the report, can be seen clearly through the prism of the Holy Cross dispute. Unwilling to go against their own tribe, politicians chose to condemn the police rather than any of their own side. The newly elected DUP MP for North Belfast, Nigel Dodds, refuses to meet the group representing Holy Cross parents because its leader is a former Republican terrorist. This is a man, Nigel Dodds, who claims to re represent all the people of North Belfast who won't even speak to us as a parent group, won't even acknowledge our letters, our faxes, our phone calls. So there's absolutely no leadership whatsoever. But Mr Dodd's aversion to former terrorists does not extend to Billy Hutchinson, a convicted killer of two Catholics. I have been with the uh, school principal, I've been with the board of governors, uh, chairman, I've been with uh, Mr Troy, the parish priest. But let's be realistic here. Uh, you know, I am a unionist and there are people in the Ardoin who are not unionists, they're Republicans, and they have chosen Sinn Féin I IRA to represent them. That's their choice. I respect that wish, and if they wish to have those people to represent them, that's up to them. Events on the Limestone Road yesterday, when Protestant children were allegedly attacked by a Catholic mob, demonstrate that hate crimes are perpetrated by both sides. I think it's very sinister indeed and to be deplored. I mean, when you're getting uh, things like these boats and so on fired at parents and kids in P1 to P3, I mean, I think it's absolutely just scandalous. And uh, I would call on community leaders who have any influence over the nationalists who are doing this to get them to stop it.
the reality is that it was such a spontaneous outburst of frustration and anger that people lashed out. They felt so frustrated that everything that they had tried to express about attacks on their area hadn't been listened to. The peaceful surroundings of the Stormont estate remained empty while events erupted in Ardoyne. The political guardians, having ignored the looming Holy Cross dispute over the summer, remained deaf to the sectarian noise. But the hate that dare not speak its name cannot be wished away. You know, unless people in this society recognise that they're bigots, you know, we'll not deal with it. Uh, and uh, I certainly recognise that I'm a bigot and I'm sectarian. Uh, and I would argue that if you cut anybody deep enough uh, in this society that you'll find a bigot. People put sectarianism down as something being bad and all the rest of it. I think we need to recognise that it's a, it's a part of our makeup, and we need to learn how to live with that and how to work with it. I admit that I've been involved in this and I admit that I was part of the problem. I also admit uh, that probably some of the things that I said last week probably led to throwing of blast bombs and other things. But I mean, I admit that. I know the PUP have obviously discovered that if you publicly confess to your sins, people are more likely to forgive you for them. Uh, but the key thing surely is to stop sinning. The politicians stand accused of making things worse by failing to move from their tribal positions. Indicative of this was Nigel Dodd's suggestion that a Protestant forum be created for the residents of Upper Ore Down to deal exclusively with Protestant concerns. There's no solution to problems of poverty in Glen Britain, which would not also be a solution to the problems of poverty sort of in the Short Strand or in the Brandywell and Derry. So what we actually need is a leadership, a political leadership, which will take on both the sectarian difficulties that exist and be, un be quite firm about those and call sectarianism by its name and make no excuses for it. Sinn Féin's representatives deny any sectarian intent, but the party has skillfully manipulated the Ardoin crisis to suit its own political agenda. Can I describe this as Alabama? Uh, this is worse than back of the bus. This is uh, driving kids from four to 11 year olds up through a tunnel uh, of hate. The Holy Cross dispute put Sinn Féin leaders on the international stage for all the right reasons, pushing Colombia off the agenda. And the comparison between Ardoyne and Alabama was carefully chosen to have a maximum impact in the all-important American market. But more cynical were the actions of a number of high-profile IRA men who marched up the Ardoyne Road past Glenbrin residents on the first day of the protest. It was an act guaranteed to provoke an angry reaction. But it's not only politicians who are to blame. A moral vacuum exists because of a failure of religious leadership. While priests and pastors in Ardoin have won praise for working together to reduce tension, their churches, particularly the Catholic Church, stand accused in the new study of feeding the problem. Protestant hate may be more visible, but the subtlety of Catholic sectarianism makes it every bit as potent. Well, you, you have to think that the formal teaching of a church does have some impact. I, I, I think I would be willing to say that among uh, many Catholics, I pick up a sense of a quiet but nonetheless confident sense of cultural and religious superiority that has to be fed by some of those teachings about the, uh, I, th I think we call it the superiority of the Catholic Church. I don't purposely set out to be sectarian, but I know it's very difficult not to preconceive what the other person, for instance, it's, not, it's difficult for me not to make a preconception about what a loyalist is likely to say, what a Protestant is likely to say. And the division of the churches contributes to division in society, according to Father Troy, an example being the difficulties surrounding mixed marriages. Me, he said, I'm getting married in the registry office. He was a devout Catholic. She was a Sunday school teacher, a devout Protestant. And I said, why? Because he said, we daren't get married in a church. I phoned 10, 12 churches before I found one. I wasn't working in a parish who would take the wedding because of sheer fear in case anything would happen. Now, that just brings home to me how sometimes it's only when you get into a crisis that you begin to find this, that there is so much difficulty. As I say, the division of the churches has had a huge influence of what we're doing here. Sinn Féin has described the Holy Cross dispute as an Alabama situation. But the campaign for black civil rights in American schools was about integration. The demand of Catholics and the Catholic Church in Northern Ireland is for segregation, a position which, according to the School of Ecumenics report, feeds sectarianism.
When you feed segregated education, which is absolutely positively intended to, as a positive community building exercise into a deeply divided society, it can have the effect of, uh, of deepening those divisions, of strengthening those divisions. From the foundation of the Northern Ireland state, the Catholic hierarchy has been determined to maintain its independent control of education. But the report argues that in today's climate, far from opposing mixed religion education, the Catholic Church has a responsibility to promote it. I wonder is there not an argument also to say the society in Northern Ireland, historically and presently, is so ruptured and divided that is it not the soft option to say let's put the children into school together Events in Ardoin have contributed to an impression that Northern Ireland is irredeemably sectarian, a belief fueled by the inability of politics to deal with the problem. But just how ingrained is sectarianism in this society? While the report on sectarianism puts extremists and killers at the top of Northern Ireland's sectarian pyramid, directly underneath are placed political and religious leaders. They are guilty of supporting the extremists unintentionally or through ambivalent attitudes. Holding the whole thing up are ordinary members of the public who keep the pyramid in place with each minor sectarian act. The report contends that the system is governed by a set of unspoken rules. The rules vary but are present in each level of society. What we found is that virtually every town, every community, even every family has its own level, its set of unspoken rules that define certain sectarian boundaries, what you will do, what you won't do, what you say, what you won't. A very instructive and liberating exercise for any group of people can be to start to identify what is the level in, in our community, because it thrives by being unspoken. It's never taught, but everybody knows it. A young man was coming home one night and uh, I met out he wasn't living here too long so he wasn't too sure of how things would work and he, got a, he tried to get a taxi, he couldn't get one so he walked home and whilst he was walking through the Ardoin Road, the lower end, he was attacked and hit with a machete in the head and he received 28 stitches in his head. That would be the type of thing that is ongoing. He said this young man who was walking home, he hadn't lived here for too long, so obviously he didn't know, he didn't know the rules, is that what you're saying? Well, that would basically be, be the case, you know. In mixed company, avoidance of any controversial topic is usually rule number one. For many parents of Holy Cross children, that meant not being seen taking their child to school. For people that do work in mixed environments, sometimes it's better just not to antagonise things if you don't have to. If there you know, if you're able to go to work in a mixed environment and everyone's worked together quite happily and peacefully, uh, I think you have to be aware of what you're, especially taking a public stand as to not to antagonise something in someone else. You're not knowingly doing it. The small Protestant community living in the Fountain in Londonderry, or Derry, depending on which rule you follow, numbers just 230 adults and is the last enclave of Protestants on the almost exclusively Catholic West Bank. It's an isolation that's keenly felt, as Protestants on the East Bank now rarely venture across the foil, even to do their shopping. The people on the water side, there's a vast number of them, a significant number, who shop in Coleraine and Ballymena, and even up to Lisburn, and uh, some would use Traban. It's estimated there's about 11 million of trade goes out of the East Bank to other cities and towns. It may be the 21st century, but the people living here still rely on the city's 17th century walls to protect them from daily attack. Events on the Ardoin Road can be felt behind the walls in the fountain, and community leaders have lost faith in the politicians to change that. If there's uh, unrest anywhere, an attack on a Catholic minority somewhere, even as far away as Belfast, it raises tension here and we become a prime target. I think it's more than politicians has to work in sectarianism. It has to be a groundswell from the bottom up. Uh, sectarianism will not be controlled or cured from politicians. It has to be at community and ground level. The politicians will react to that. They're dependent on the votes. They are the symptom of the problem.
Once again, the political institutions in Northern Ireland are on a countdown to collapse. Time runs out this weekend when the Secretary of State will be forced to suspend the Assembly, put the agreement into review or set a date for elections that would probably make the whole stalemate worse. Just three years ago, more than 70% of voters endorsed the agreement. Many thought it would reduce sectarian strife. It hasn't. In fact, it's debatable whether the ugly scenes at Holy Cross have been a threat to the agreement or a product of it. Well, what we've seen in Ardoin, of course, is symptomatic of the wider problem in that it's a, a reflection of the basic sectarianism of Northern Ireland politics. I mean, since the inception of the state here, and indeed uh, before that, politics has been constructed around the idea of communal identity. And therefore, to some extent, uh, a, you know, a, 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 it's a contest for scarce resources between the Catholic and Protestant communities. Now, that contest has actually been uh, given formal shape and pattern and been validated by the Belfast Agreement, which is a frankly sectarian document, which uh, doesn't uh, define or analyse the nature of the sectarian divide in Northern Ireland, uh, but which pretends to be a remedy to it. Sectarian conflict is endemic on the streets of Northern Ireland. In North Belfast, the RUC now mans six permanent positions and flashpoints across the constituency. It's estimated that overtime is currently running at around 1,000 man-hours per day. Even supporters of the agreement admit that things are worse. We had you know, 30 years of violence. The sectarianism wasn't as naked as this for the simple reason that people felt that there were people carrying out the sectarianism in their name and they didn't need to say anything. Now that those people are not doing it to the extent that they were doing it during the past 30 odd years, uh, it brings it about that people need to say it and they need to act it out on the streets. And that's our difficulty. Our difficulty is that that's what people are doing. People are now saying you know, that people aren't being shot and bombed, so they need to bring it out in another way. The peace process has brought nothing for this community. I mean, they the went come up with statements saying, you know, once the peace process takes hold, your life's going to change, there'll be more jobs, there'll be more of this. If anything, it's get worse for this community. For people in places like Ardoin and Glen Bryn, one of the few points of agreement is that the agreement has made little difference. I think that without good political leadership without political structures that we can all live with, we are most unlikely to get rid of sectarianism. And yet at the same time, I think you can have the theoretically ideal political solution. And if we are not communities capable of living at peace within those structures, well, then we'll just bring down the structures eventually. Last Thursday, the assembly was recalled to discuss the terrorist attack on the United States and to offer sympathy to the American people. But even then, parties couldn't stay in the chamber long enough to deliver a united message. Terrorism cannot be dialogued with. For Mr. Jerry Adams, MP. Mr. Adams. And even if a breakthrough in the peace process is reached in crisis talks later this week, the core problem of sectarianism will remain unsolved. The world order may have been transformed by the horrific events in America last week, but as these scenes from our doing today demonstrate, the integrity of our local sectarian quarrel endures.